before I pray, many of you know that uh, Eric Slagle's mom has been ill for quite some time. In the last few months, she's been ebbing and flowing uh, in and out of hospital, between hospital and a nursing home. During the Sunday school hour this morning, Eric got word that uh, recent reports have shown her markers are way up and apparently her disease has spread all over her body and they have made the choice to take her off all medications. Um, so Eric left uh, by God's grace. We had some men out in the lobby who could pray for him. He and Marcia are on their way right now to, uh, to her home to be with her, perhaps today or tomorrow, her dying day. So please remember Eric and his family. Um, would you be aware of that? And so as I reference that in my prayer, um, you'll understand why. <clears throat> God, I thank you that uh, whenever uh, you bring Miss Nagel into your presence, uh, it will be in your perfect timing. As we heard in our Sunday school class this morning from Psalm 139, before we were formed in our mother's wombs, all of our days were appointed for us by you. And uh, Lord, I thank you for the privilege of having known Mrs. Slagle. I thank you... Uh, for allowing Eric and Marcia to go now, today, and uh, thank you that in weeks past and even in not too many days ago, Eric has been able to say all of the things he wanted to say to his mom. Um, I pray, Lord, as, uh, as it is your pleasure that they might arrive there before she comes into your, to your presence and uh, be able to comfort her once again. I pray for Eric's brother, Rick, God, that through all this, you might uh, bring him to yourself. I pray for Eric and Marcia as uh, they are around others there in these uh, difficult times who do not know you, that they might show, even through their genuine grief and emotion, that you are the God to be trusted and loved and worshipped. God of hope. God who gives, even in times like this, the peace that passes all understanding. I trust you to do that, God, for my brother and sister and for Mrs. Slagle, oh God. Lord, I pray for us as we have a message this morning that is primarily for believers. Uh, I ask you by your spirit to do what I know you already plan to do and you work in the hearts of everybody here in the ways that you have foreordained to do. And you can and perhaps will do things that I never would have imagined you would do through this sermon on this text. But I trust you to do that for your glory. I do pray, Lord, for any persons who are with us this morning or maybe listening in other places or listening later who are not yet living a life of faith in Christ as Savior and Lord, that you would show them in your kindness and mercy, show them, God, that Apart from Christ, there is no eternal life for them. There is only an eternal death awaiting them. And that because of their own sins, just like that's what all of us here deserve. We are all our sinners. By your grace, God, would you give faith to someone even today in this room? Open ears, God. Open eyes. Give spiritual life. Help the sinners who are not yet born again to see they need Jesus. Give them the faith to believe, I pray. Draw them to yourself. And on behalf of everybody here, God, who is a believer, thank you that at a time in our past, whether we were interested or not, you drew us to yourself. And you quickened us and gave us life in Jesus, who is the life of us. It's in his name that I pray these things and I ask you to help us as we worship now. Amen. What did you expect? What did you expect when you arrived this morning for the Sunday school hour? Did you expect that someone would stand before you and teach the Bible for the better part of an hour? 
Were your expectations met? Isn't it a good thing that at this church we teach the Bible in the Sunday school hour? Even if you only arrived here for this worship hour, what did you expect when you came here? Did you expect to see some Christian friends uh, with whom you might have fellowship exchanges? When the service started, did you expect to sing some good songs with sound theology? Isn't it a wonderful blessing I hope we never get past the blessing of this, that we have a worship leader and choir director who deliberately choose songs that are God-centered and have glorious lyrics and, and are appropriate to be sung by God's people to the honor of Him. Isn't that wonderful? Did you come expecting to hear prayers this morning? Public prayers to God on behalf of people here and people around the world. Did you expect to have the opportunity to worship God with tithes and offerings? And did you expect in this portion of the service, no matter who is preaching, did you expect to hear the Bible proclaimed expositionally? Rather than a string of anecdotes and clever stories and philosophies and psychological insights and things like that, designed to make you all feel better about yourselves when you went home, did you expect to hear God's Word proclaimed? And aren't you thankful that every time you walk in this building, you can expect the Word of God to be preached from this pulpit and these Sunday school lecterns, even if there's a substitute preacher? But let's think about this. What did you expect to do when you came in the building this morning by way of personal engagement with God and His Word? Did you come prepared and expectant to give something to God? I hope you didn't come with the attitude, Lord, my name is Jimmy and I'll take all you give me. Did we come to this room expecting that God is going to move in some way or another on our hearts and minds through the music, through the prayers, and through the teaching and preaching of His Word? And did we come in expecting to and intending to do something with what God teaches us and reminds us of in and through His Holy Scriptures? Michael, is that me popping? Should I move this thing around? Move it which way? Away from my mouth. How about that? That's better? Okay. So I ask you, wouldn't it be good for us, and more importantly, wouldn't it be pleasing and honoring to God for us to come into the worship assemblies full of expectations of what God will do and what we will offer right heartedly to God? Wouldn't that be good for us to come that way rather than just coming to say, I'll plop down and see what happens. Dr. John Piper wrote, when worship is reduced to disinterested duty, it ceases to be worship. When worship is reduced to disinterested duty, it ceases to be worship. And our primary text for this morning reveals attitudes and actions about corporate worship that are as far opposite disinterested duty as you can get. It's a text portion that's going to show us how God will make worship to be someday purely so. And it shows how God desires for corporate worship to be done always. I want to ask you to join me, if you will, at the book of Micah. Micah is one of the minor prophets. He's between Jonah and Nahum, if that helps you any. I have cheated by putting a little card in the text portion. Book of Micah. Micah's prophecies came in the 8th century B.C. He was a contemporary of uh, Isaiah and Amos. And during Micah's time, the Jewish people were awash in sin. It was a time of great 
moral decay and degradation. Uh, many of the Jews uh, had been mistreating and otherwise taking advantage of their own kinspeople and their neighbors. They had turned, many of them, from following God faithfully. Some had embraced idolatry and various pagan worship practices. Uh, and God had had enough. God had had enough, and he revealed through Micah that he was going to take severe retributive actions. He was going to send invading armies to come in, to devastate the land, to subjugate some of the Jews, to kill some of them off, and carry off into captivity many more of them. Just how severe is it going to be, God? Chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins, and the mountain of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. Whoa. And all that was, of course, yet to come at the time Michael was prophesying, but it certainly would come as God had said. And so Micah is a book full of hard things to come and showing them why it's coming because of their various unrepentant sins. But even within Micah's telling of all these hardships that are coming, there are little pockets in this book of good news, encouraging things that God is going to do in and through them and for them after the time of the invasions, after the time of the captivity. Wonderful God-accomplished things of restoration, restoring the people to their homeland, but more importantly, restoring their hearts to love and honor Yahweh. And last Sunday, we looked at one of those positive pockets in God's message through Micah from the first part of chapter 6, where the, the culmination of what God wanted and wants now from His chosen people is phrased thusly. Uh, chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This morning's portion points to a future distant time of God's people honoring Him, a time of God giving peace. And some of the wording here is probably going to be familiar to you, and I want you to listen to this beautiful portrait of what God will do. We're in chapter 4 now, and I'm going to read the first five verses. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and the people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways and we will walk in His paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the people walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of Yahweh our God, forever and ever. Isn't that wonderful? Don't you love that part in verse 3 about nations not lifting up their swords against other nations? There's going to come a time when that will be. Don't you love that description in verse 4 about no one shall make them afraid. Oh. And then, how about this scenario at the end of verse 5? We will walk in the name of the Lord our God, Forever and ever, oh Lord, hasten the day. Now just before we begin to look more closely at these verses that are our core text for this morning, on a personal note, uh, not long ago I preached a sermon from this very same text in a, another church in another state. And today's sermon is not exactly that same sermon. There's nothing wrong with preaching the same sermon in two different places, but that's just not my normal practice. And so while I was poring over these texts and trying to select the various portions for these three sermons that that we're doing uh, from Micah, I I was trying to maneuver around these verses at the beginning of chapter 4. But the Spirit of God kept drawing me back here. So my conclusion is there must be someone or someones in addition to me 
who really need to hear this today. And I trust the Lord to use this in whatever ways and what always He is foreordained to do. That said, let's look again at the two verses that are primarily in view for the rest of this morning. Verses 1 and 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. You to note in verse 1 we're told that this will come to pass in the latter days. Some translations have it the last days. You may not be surprised to learn that scholars and interpreters don't all agree on just when this is going to be fulfilled. But most do agree that it has not yet been fulfilled, certainly not ultimately so. And Micah's use of reference to the coming Messiah in this book and the Messianic kingdom seems to indicate that when God is talking about here is a time after Messiah has come to earth at a time during Perhaps what some call the millennium, maybe at the end of the millennium. For this morning, we're not going to concern ourselves with nailing down the just when that Micah had in mind. But I do want to take two particular notes about things related to the certainty of what is portrayed here. One is this. Note in verse 1 the phrase, it shall come to pass. Remember, Micah got this message from the Lord. Chapter 1, verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Micah, right? And what we know about God is this, what he says he will do. What God purposes and plans he always brings to pass. And going in the other direction, everything that God does are things that he has purpose to do and it's what it has pleased him to do. God always has his way. When you're the sovereign of the universe, you can have your way, and your way is always perfect. God will do this. And another thing is this, and I want you to follow my reasoning here because this is why I think it's appropriate for us to make application from what is revealed in these two verses. This is a way that God surely will make things, which means it's a way God wants things to be. And God has always wanted and still wants and always will want sincere, right-hearted worshipers of Him. That's a consistent revelation of God throughout the Bible. God's heart and priorities about proper worship of Him do not change. They are eternal just like He's eternal. God desires sincere, right-hearted worshipers. And since God desires and plans for these kinds of worshipers in the end, in the last days, then it is certainly His desire and purpose for there to be such kind of worshipers now, in as much as there can be. God is pleased and honored in any era when there are sincere worshipers of Him with these kind of attitudes, with these kind of worship actions, and in these kind of worship assemblies. And therefore, we can conclude that this 2,700-year-plus-old portrait from an Old Testament minor prophet, it is exquisitely pertinent to we 21st century believers. And it is explicitly pertinent to we believers in this church, even this morning. So, let's look at four perspectives from these two verses. I want to elaborate them a little bit, and I'm going to take them in a slightly different order than they appear in the text. Here's the first perspective. What is expected to come forth from the house of God? What is expected to come forth from the house of God? You notice in verse 2 that the people say, Come, let us go up to the house of the God of Jacob. That's the description of the assembly place. The house of God. We still refer to it that way today. Sometimes some of the older ones of us do. The house of the Lord. The Lord's house. 
And so the people will go there, and at that place, this is what will come forth. Look at the end of verse 2. From Zion shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Which is to say, God's truth will be proclaimed there. The teachings heard in that place will be God truths. The word of the Lord shall go forth. How important that is. How necessary that is. By the grace of the Lord and intentionality of the leadership of this church, for the past several decades, we have made a priorital habit of proclaiming God's holy word from the Sunday school rooms and from the preaching pulpit here, may it ever be so. And most of you are aware that uh, in these same past several decades, all across our land, in many places, not every place, but in many places, there has been a decline of the preaching of God's word expositionally in favor of pleasant talks that don't mention hell or sin or repentance or any of the other hard stuff from the Bible. And, and part of the reasoning for that in some of those places is that the so-called seekers who come, we don't want them to be offended and turned off by the hard stuff and stop coming. Well, they may or may not stop coming. But a few years of preaching like that, and you wind up with a bunch of church folks that are stunted in their doctrinal understanding and Christian growth. You get a generation of churchgoers who have shallow theological moorings. Many people don't know what they believe, or if they know what they believe, they don't know why they believe it. And they wind up being what Pastor Sam Cathy called a generation of spiritual pygmies. you got a whole lot of hallelujahs running around, but not a whole lot of holiness. See the importance of a steady diet of God's Word being preached. Several weeks ago, Late one night, Janice and I were returning from a trip uh, to North Carolina, and I turned on the, a Christian radio station, a large, well-known Christian radio station, not the one in our town, uh, stationed out of North Carolina. And I turned on, and there was, I picked up right after the beginning of a man preaching, and I didn't recognize his voice. Um, but I noticed he had a smooth voice, and he was a good speaker, and so I started listening, and as the message went on, I realized he was preaching, I put that in quotation marks, a, a man-made philosophy. It was a kind of a... kind of a four-part philosophical structure that described Christians. And with each one, he put a Bible verse to it to make it, I guess, sound holy. Uh, it wasn't the Myers-Briggs categories. It wasn't the one with the lion and the otter and the golden retriever. It wasn't the four love languages. It wasn't the four points of the compass. It was four categories of Christians that this guy apparently had made up himself. And as I listened, everything he said wasn't wrong. There was some truth in what he was saying. But there was a glaring deficiency as I heard it because he seemed to be implying if you are this kind of Christian, you don't have to concern yourself with being these other ways. Because, Ben, God has made you this way, so you just be like that, and don't worry about that. But, Lynn, he's made you this way, so you be that way, but you don't have to worry about... And I heard what he was saying, and I thought, no, no. The Bible says that all Christians should, exhi should exhibit all of those characteristics. And I know sometimes they edit those things and maybe the part where he was clear about that was truncated. I don't know. But I found myself thinking, this is very misleading and this could be very damaging to an immature believer who, who thinks he's off the hook for being those other categories. And then I thought, why is this guy coming up with his own stuff? He's got the airwaves. Why doesn't he just preach the Bible? And then at the end... The announcer identified the speaker, and to my dismay, he was one of the famous West Coast preachers of a big mega church. 
which means he has lots of listeners and lots of people reading his books. Some of you have probably read one of his books. And I thought, if most of his stuff is like what I heard tonight, those who get a steady diet of this guy are going to be underfed and perhaps wind up being malnourished. Now, my purpose in giving that illustration is not simply to break bad on that particular preacher, and that's why I'm not mentioning his name, but it is to point out that nowadays a lot of stuff on the religious airwaves, as I understand it, a lot of religious sites on the Internet, and sadly, in a lot of church pulpits, there is a filling of things that are not sound, deep, biblical instruction. And so this is a reminder to what probably most of you already know and do. Be careful what you listen to. Be careful what you read. Thank the Lord there is still some good preaching on the airways. You just have to find it. Thank the Lord there, there's been in recent years a resurgence in some of our seminaries, particularly a couple of our Southern Baptist seminaries, of training young men who understand that it is important to rightly divide the word of truth and exposit it in the church pulpits and our seminaries are sending those guys out and they're permeating the land with good solid preaching again and i bless god that all three of the proposed candidates for our next pastor lead pastor position are all men who know god's word who love god's word who are committed to preaching god's word they already do it and they will do it when god brings one of them here and I thank God for a pastor church team who wouldn't have presented to us any other kind of person. And I say that not with, to be prideful, but it is good that we keep our priorities straight about what should come from the pulpit. Apostle Paul said to young pastor Timothy, and now that it's in our Bibles, he says it to all pastors, preach the word. 2 Timothy 4, 2a. Keruxon ton logon. Preach it. Herald it, proclaim it, and that's an instruction in the text. It's not a suggestion. It's not an option. Preach the Word. And you and I know why the Word should be preached, don't we? Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divisions of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart, and we need that to do that for us. Amen? We are the recipients of this process. All of us here who attend regularly that God takes His Word and applies it by His Spirit to our hearts and minds and He changes us and He challenges us and He grows us. Sometimes He warns us. Sometimes He warms us. Sometimes He convicts us and other times He comforts us. And He's edifying and equipping us and all by the Scriptures. And sometimes He does multiples of those in the same service. And I say, thank you, Lord, that we have your holy word and that we can read it and meditate on it and hear it preached and taught to us when we come to this church. And I hope you can see with me right here from Micah 4, 2, that this is a God priority applicable to all times that at the place where God's people assemble in his presence, what they should hear is the word of the Lord coming forth. For God's pleasure... And God's honor, may it ever be in this house. Perspective number two, the movement of God's people. The movement of God's people. And I use the word movement here because some people chafe at the word discipline. By the way, discipline is a good word. Uh, it's a good thing when we have spiritual discipline. But, but the movement of which I speak is seen in our text as a deliberate purpose of the people. It's this, this deliberate purpose reveals their sincere heart for God and reveals their priority of corporate worship for God. And here in our text, what is this purposeful and priorital and disciplined movement going to look like? It's going to look like this. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. Now watch this. And the people shall flow to it. Many nations will come and say, Come on, let's go to the house of the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. 
You see that? Come, let's go. The house of the Lord is called here the mountain of the Lord. And note the deliberate movement in the first part of verse 2 of God's people. Come, let us go up. Let's do it. Let's go. It sounds a lot like what the folks said to David in Psalm 122. 1. Let us go into the house of the Lord. And surely we can all see that their determination to go and their discipline in going is, is revealed by this statement. Come, let us go. This is on purpose. And they're saying that would be a reminder and an encouragement and exhortation to other people. It's like, come on, let's go together. Let's all go to the house of the Lord and learn and worship God. And I believe, I'm convinced this is so, that this going up with, is with desire and delight. This is more than just an obligation to fulfill God's commands. Remember, the portrait here is of a time when God's people are right-hearted toward Him. Remember their stated purpose at the end of verse 5. We will walk in the name of Yahweh our God forever and ever. That reveals right-heartedness. We want to walk in God's ways. And so these right-hearted God-lovers they desire to assemble with like-minded folk and, and, and sincere worship they want to offer to their saving God. And, and such attitudes like that about their assemblies both reflect and create a desire and a delight. Much like David's expression in Psalm 122, 1, the part I left out a minute ago, he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. That's the way the heart of the people ought to be. I'm glad. Were you delighting to come here this morning? Were you really, I'm looking forward to going over to Three Rivers and worshiping together and singing and giving and praying and hearing prayers and fellowship and absorbing the Word of God. Did you come with a delight? If not, are there things that maybe you could do so that next Sunday and the Sunday after that, or maybe even this Wednesday night, <laughs> by the way, last Wednesday night, this past Wednesday night, what a beautiful time of assembly we had. Oh, Brian taught us a new song or new to us, and it just was a glorious, I can't wait till we sing that here on Sunday mornings. And it was a sweet time of gathering. Uh, every Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, right here, you're all welcome. Smiling, hear that? Smiling, you're all welcome. Love to have you. But are there things we could do deliberately in our hearts and our minds, maybe so that for God's honor, we can arrive here with more delight and more desire and more gladness in our soul? I think it would be good for us to be very careful not only about our purpose to come, but to come ready and right-hearted and worshipfully. Last year, I was speaking at a conference in New York City, and after one of the evening services, Janice engaged some young man uh, who had come and... Um, she asked him a question about something like, what are you going to do after the, now that the service is over? And he said, I'm going to go get something to eat. And she said something to him like, oh, you didn't have supper before you came? And he said, no, I worked downtown in Manhattan. And I got off at 5, and I walked from my workplace to the subway. And I rode the subway out of downtown, out to the borough. And then I had to catch two buses, two different buses to get here standing up all the way and then when I got off the last bus I had to walk a few blocks to get here and I didn't have time and all that to have supper but I wanted to be on time and not miss anything I bless God for that kind of commitment and I think God is honored and pleased with that kind of commitment now you're, you're all familiar with this so we won't take time to turn to it but Psalm 100, verse 4 tells us, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and come into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. 
And the second part of verse 2 in that same psalm says, Come before him with joyful singing. Something that struck me a few years ago was that the psalmist doesn't merely say, Do all that while you're in the place of worship, though that is an expectation that we will do that while we're here. But note that he says, Enter the gates with thanksgiving. Come into the courts. Come into the temple area with praise. Seeming to suggest that we arrive at the worship place with attitudes and actions of worship already. Colloquially, show up at the church already giving thanks. Already making melody to God in your heart. Already being thankful to Him. Now we may not practice coming in from the parking lot singing the Hallel Psalms together. But we should practice coming to God with minds and hearts that are already melodious in praise and worship of Him. Amen? That would be a good thing to do. And all of this coming together right heartily before the Lord, it is coming together with gladness so that you can come before God and truly worship Him. And, and as part of all that, I want you to look carefully at, at the beautiful poetic language Micah uses here at the end of verse 1 about these gatherings of the house of the Lord. Micah says, And the people shall flow to it. That's what my translation and the ESV says. NAS has that. The people will stream to it. I can't fully express to you how that picture causes my soul to soar with joy. At, at the gatherings of God's people, whether they're dozens or hundreds or thousands, to think that all of the right-hearted people would come streaming to the house of the Lord with smiles on their face and songs in their hearts and expectation and delight. We're coming to fellowship and worship with others to give glory to our God. And sometimes you stand out on the front if you come early enough and stand at those double doors where the ushers give you the, the, the programs and you see in the lower level and then the second level and even up in the credit union parking lot, some of us who park up there and wind our way through the woods and you look and from, it seems like from every direction, here come people on Sunday morning streaming to the house of God. And I just say, oh Lord, thank you. Look at them come. Look at them come. Bring them in, God. Bring them in. And may we all be right hearted. Cause it to be at this church and in thousands of churches across the land. Right-hearted, pre-worshipped, prepared to worship believers, stringing, streaming, streaming to the house of the Lord. That will be pleasing to God. And I pray, brothers and sisters, may you and I, every one of us, purpose to come every Sunday that way. That way. Not just showing up but coming, streaming to worship God. And I bless God there are folk among us who do that. You come already ready. And you know what? When you come that way, you make it richer for all the rest of us. Thank you for doing that. And so we've, we've got the people now in the worship assembly or on their way, and they're expectant. They, they are intentionally expectant. They're expecting the fellowship with other believers they're expecting to sing songs of praise. They're expecting to give tithes and offerings. They're expecting to join their hearts with others in prayers to God. And I was thinking about this. Wouldn't it be great if every one of us came every time we assembled expecting and prepared to do this? While I'm at church today, I'm going to purpose to find at least one other person and speak to them face to face a word of encouragement. A word of blessing. A word of comfort. Something that will help them and edify them. And I'm not going to leave the church house until I find somebody to speak a word of affirmation to. Wouldn't that be great if every one of us came trying to do that and did it? Hello? Really, do y'all think that would be good? Would it make God honored if we did that sincerely? And it would help the church, wouldn't it? What an expectation. And all those things I just mentioned about expecting the, the prayer and the songs and the fellowship and all that, they just 
They are biblical, but they just don't happen to be explicit in our Micah text for today. But something that is explicit as an expectation is this. Perspective number three. The dynamic of God teaching us in His house and our learning from Him there. The dynamic of God teaching us in His house and our learning from Him there. Look again at the first part of verse 2. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways. Your version may say, That He may teach us His ways. Since they're going up expecting to be taught God's ways, isn't it reasonable to conclude that they are expecting to listen and learn? I mean, who would say, when we get there, I think God's going to have something to teach. I'm going to close my ears and let my mind wander to other things. That would be crazy if you're a believer. And surely we can see that a clear and correct implication from this text is that those right-hearted worshipers who stream to the house of God, they are anticipating I'm going to learn from God today. Knowing that God's truth will be presented to them there, they will be intentional and diligent in listening to and taking in whatever the Lord teaches them. Doesn't that sound to you like their heart set from what we see here? From the text words, come, let us go up, that God may teach us. And I would say to you and me, we should always be expecting to learn or be reminded of something or be exhorted or maybe be convicted whenever the truths of God are proclaimed to us. Amen? It shouldn't be something we just sit through and hear. One person's style of preaching or teaching may not suit us as much as somebody else's, but style notwithstanding, when the Word of God is presented rightly divided, we should expect to have the Spirit of God impress something on our minds and hearts. That should be our expectation. And since the spiritual dynamic is that God is speaking to us through His Word, we will do well, if we're not already good listeners, to train ourselves to be good listeners. We will do well to discipline ourselves to not let our minds wander while the Word of God is being preached or taught. Because it is God speaking to us. We will do well to work at keeping focused by whatever and what all means can help us keep focused. Maybe for some of you, Taking notes will help you keep focus. For some, I've heard him say, that distracts me. I'd rather just listen. Whatever works for you. Maybe for some, sitting closer to the front so there are fewer distractions. For some of us, that helps. And there's room up here. Y'all, next Sunday, we'll move a little closer. That's, that's okay. Could be at times, for some of us, some of us would help ourselves to stay more focused on Sunday morning by like going to bed earlier on Saturday night. No accusation unless the Spirit of God put one on you. Whatever it takes, we ought to do what all it takes that we might learn well what God is teaching us from the proclamation of His Word. God is worthy of that effort from us, isn't He? There are a lot of good listeners in this church, and I bless God for that. And there are a lot of people in this church who have learned much from the Lord. And I thank you for making our church stronger by what you know and what you share with us. And yet, all of us still have much to learn, don't we? All of us ought to always be learning. I hope I'm learning the day God calls me home. And one of the chief ways, not the only, but one of the chief ways that God has designed through which God teaches us Bible knowledge is when we assemble and a prepared up, prayed up man stands before us to preach the word. 
And maybe, just maybe, somebody here today, in addition to me, needs to be reminded it honors God for us to come to the assembly prepared to give attention to God. It honors God for us to be ready to be here and then to be ready and expecting and be diligent about hearing that God will teach us His ways. But that's not all. In this Micah 4 portrait of how God designs and desires worship to be, there's something even beyond learning. There's a, a response expected when people have learned. Look again in verse 2. Right after the phrase that says, He will teach us His ways, look what they say. And we shall walk in His paths. Do you hear the intentionality of the hearers and the worshipers there? God will teach so that we may walk. We're going to walk in the ways that God teaches us. We will live out what we learn. That's perspective number four from our text this morning. Our purpose to respond to and put into practice what we learn from God. And I chose those words carefully. Not just, well, if it happens to come out that I do something with it, okay. No, our purpose to respond to and put into practice what we learn from God. And this perspective, as we see it here in the Micah 4, 2 portrait, this is what God wants at all times from all who learn from Him, that what He teaches, we live out. It may not always be easy, but it ought to always be our habit. Jesus revealed the same expectation from people of faith. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's not a burden, brothers and sisters. That's a blessing. But it's an expectation. Learn them, yes. Remember them, yes. But more, keep them. The keep verb indicating obeying them. Actuating them in Christian living. The Apostle Paul instructed the Christians at Philippi and instructs us in the same way now that it's in our Bible Philippians 4, 9, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, you practice these things. That is to say, you live out what you learned from me that I taught you by word and an example. That should be our habit, brothers and sisters, and our heart about everything God teaches us related to Christian living. Learn it, then live it. Learn it, then live it. Think about this. This is true for everybody here. There was a time when you knew nothing about God or His teachings. So everything you know about God and how to obey God, somewhere in your past, God, through some means or some person or another, had to teach you that, right? So if you are knowing it and obeying it, that means you're already living out this process. I'm living what I learned, but maybe it would be good for us to be a little more intentional about that. A little more careful. A little more comprehensive about that. Now that Micah has reminded us of this, like these Micah 4, 2 folk, we ought to be applying what God teaches us by walking in God's paths. That pleases our Lord and Savior. In fact, Let's be intentional that way right now. Years ago, I knew a man who told me about a practice of his pastor in his home church. That at the end of every sermon, the pastor would say, Okay, everybody get out a piece of paper and a pencil. And this was before y'all had those things you scribble on with your uh, styluses. And he would say, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes right now. When everybody here, write down something from what you just heard preached that you are going to motivate you to do something this week. I thought, that's a pretty good deal. I've even tried that a time or two. I don't do that regularly. Might not be a bad idea, but I want us to do it now. I hope you don't think this is so spiritually juvenile. I know some of you have steel trap minds and you say, oh, I don't need to write it down, brother. I'll remember it. Would you humor me? And I'm asking you right now, I'm going to give you about a minute. 
write down one thing that you could purpose to do in the coming week. Some responsive action that you could make that would be for the pleasure of God from this morning's textual references or the sermonic applications therefrom. Maybe the Spirit of God has already impressed you about a thing. Maybe you'll have to think about it for a minute. But I think you could say, this would be a good idea for me to do this. So, uh, if you will, start writing. I'm going to write on my own page right here. Okay, let me close this way. God has revealed to us here in the first couple of verses of Micah chapter 4 that it is pleasing to Him when people of faith purpose to come before Him with this expectation and intentionality. He will teach us His Word and we will walk in His paths. Brothers and sisters, I hope you know, I think you know, it is a privilege to walk in the paths of the Lord. Amen? It is a privilege to have God teach us how to walk and then to walk in His paths. And I'm sure that you have experienced that it is a satisfying joy to walk in the paths of the Lord. It's not always easy. Sometimes it's not even fun. But it's always a joy to walk in to learn and then walk in the paths of the Lord. But far more important than that, it pleases and honors our Lord and Savior when we learn from Him and then walk in His ways. Keeping His commandments as an obedience of love and gratitude. And I say to you, we ought to be grateful that in our country we still have the freedom to assemble like this in worship. We ought to be grateful that we have this church to stream to, to worship God together. And I know that many of you are grateful for those blessings, and you regularly give God thanks for that. And I prayed last week, and I hope some of you will join me in praying in the weeks and months to come, that the Lord will stir us to become more and more a body of believers who right-heartedly preparedly, expectantly come streaming to the house of the Lord to worship Him in spirit and in truth and to learn from Him and then to walk in the paths in which He leads us and teaches us. What a beautiful, God-pleasing portrait of a church. He is the God worth coming to. He is the God worthy of our praising Him. He is the God worthy of our listening to Him and learning from Him. And He is the God who is worthy of our living for Him in faith every day and forever. Amen. God, thank You. Thank You so much, Lord, for these words. I'm so glad to know, Lord, that there's going to come a day when this has going to be fulfilled fully, purely, gloriously. But I thank You, God, that it is instructive for us now. I thank you, Lord, that there are a lot of people in this room right now who came to church this morning with these kinds of attitudes and these kinds of hearts and these kinds of expectations. God, make more of us more often be that way. If anybody here needed to be stirred, maybe convicted, please, God, don't let them blow it off by lunchtime. You keep this pressed on our hearts, God, for your glory 
for your design to be fulfilled for your divine delight. May we be a church full of right-hearted worshipers learning and living and may that permeate throughout the community for the glorious beacon of truth that you are to shine forth that bring even others to come streaming in. And thank you, God, for other pastors and other churches around the area and across the land and across the globe who also are proclaiming your truth and worshiping you in spirit and in truth and coming with glad hearts. Thank you, God, that things have not been snuffed out yet. It looks like things are going to hell in a handbasket. It looks like we're in severe moral decay, but it's not all gone yet, God. You have your people. Grow them in number, I pray, and grow them in fervency for your name's sake. And for the glory of Christ. Amen. Yes.